Hello and welcome to the 2021 Aspen Ideas Festival. I'm Rohan Guntilika. Um, I work as a design lead for the National Health Service in Scotland, where I am currently. Um, and I'm super excited to be joined today by Jane McGonagall, um, the Director of Games Research at the Institute for the Future. Hey Jane, how are you? Hi Rohan, I'm, I'm hot. It's a <laughs> summer day and uh, excited to be a part of the festival and talking to you. Um, and you know, we, you know, Jane, we've known each other. I, I, was, I just looked at it up probably about just over 10, 10 years, maybe 10, 12 years. Definitely, I, I became aware of your work back in 2008 when I got really interested in a big outdoor playful games and you were very much a, a leading light in that space and then um, uh, moved into more and more related fields and I guess that's what we're talking about today. But I think um, maybe where I'd want to start um, is just understand a bit more <laughs> about what you do, I guess your, your job title is as the Director of Game Research and Development at the Institute for the Future. Could you just tell me a bit more? You know, I always looked at that title and thought, oh, that sounds really great. Um, <laughs> but what does it actually mean? So maybe you can tell us a bit more about that. Definitely. Uh, I think the best way to explain the work that I do is maybe to talk a little bit about the two words that I'm really obsessed with right now, which are unthinkable, Sure. and unimaginable. Have you found yourself, Rohan, using those words a little bit in the past year or two? <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. I mean, so I actually did some research and crunched some numbers. Just in the year 2020, there were more than one and a half million English language headlines with the words unthinkable or the word unthinkable and more than two million English language news headlines with the word unimaginable and thinking about the pandemic, sure. social protests, extreme weather, historic wildfire. Um, and it really does seem like there's something very zeitgeisty about these two words. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of really obsessed with figuring out what do we mean when we say that something is unthinkable or we say that something's unimaginable you know is it is it unthinkable because we have refused to think about it it was it was something we didn't want to think about because it's it sounded you know too awful we wanted to put it out of our minds or maybe we felt like we we couldn't control it so there was no point in thinking about it sure you know is it unimaginable because maybe you know, we just have never experienced it before personally or humanity has never lived through this kind of event or crisis. So we just don't have data to draw on our, our minds just kind of draw blank. So I guess you could say what I do at the Institute for the Future is I try to develop tools and games and brain training techniques to help people think the unthinkable and imagine the unimaginable. So we're not blindsided by surprising events. So we feel like we can prepare for anything and also so we can be more ambitious and hopeful in what we imagine can be different, right? Because social progress and social change, often that too feels unthinkable because we just don't believe that it's possible. And, and is it something to do with, because we're, you know, we tend to see very much through our own individual lenses and how, like, is it something about, you know, the unthinkable being at a, at a much bigger scale than what we can in, in, in sort of individually relate to? Is that, is there, is there something about the individual and the collective in that? That's it's a very interesting question. I mean, what, so what my research shows is the, the primary obstacle is just sort of the, the default mode that the brain mm. works in, right? So as we sort of grow our lives, our brain is building mental models so that it's not constantly reinterpreting the world around us, right? The brain wants to conserve energy. Like every thought we have takes glucose and like, I mean, it's using up our body's resources. It doesn't want to have to work so hard all the time. So it starts to look for patterns and then it, it builds them into the brain, mental models. We don't have to, you know, figure out what everything means every time we encounter it. The problem is when, you know, new things happen or new risks are on the horizon, if our brain doesn't have accurate models to draw on, it hasn't encountered it before, no one has encountered it before, then we kind of can get stuck. Either we we just don't think about it because it, it's like we literally can't imagine it. Our brains, I have no information to, you know, to see it into this. Um, or we uh, we just think kind of in the wrong way. We assume that it won't be 
as bad as you know an expert might be predicting or it won't be as hard as they're telling us to prepare for which is i mean certainly what we've seen with the pandemic but i can i can actually help you and maybe all of our friends who have joined us for this session it kind of experience this like great let's do it what are we doing okay so i create two kinds of simulations um the first kind of mental simulation it's just a thought experiment you do in your own head we're just trying to okay. strengthen the neurological pathways that allow you to Think of things you've never thought of before and fill in the sort of blanks when your brain is like, I don't know, like, let's help it know. So I'm going to ask you to do two things. The first one's very easy. Okay. I want you to imagine yourself waking up tomorrow morning, really tomorrow. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask you to sort of imagine it in as, as vivid detail as you can, as if it were actually happening. And I'll ask you a series of questions to help you put more details into it. And you just tell me yes or no. So as you picture yourself waking up tomorrow morning, do you know what town or city you'll be in with the locate the physical location, the geographic yes. location? Yes. Okay. Do you know, can you picture what room you'll be in? Yes. Can you picture who else might be in the room, a person, an animal? Yes. Can you picture what you might be wearing or not wearing? Uh, yes. Okay. Can you picture what the temperature might be like? Yeah. I w yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and maybe what, what emotion you might wake up with, energetic, excited for today, or t exhausted, stressed, anxious. Can you? Yeah. If it's anything to do the last few days, then yeah, I can guess. I can okay. Guess <laughs> All right. So that's, you know, it's kind of easy, right? When you think about the near sure. future, you've got all this information to draw on. Your brain yeah. is not, you know, up. so, okay. So now let's do it again, but let's imagine you're waking up 10 years from today. Okay. All right. So try to do the same thing where you are, who's with you, what you're feeling, what you're, what you're like the first thing on your mind to do that day is. Um, yeah, that's truly hard. Cause I, you know, me and my wife have been talking about we're moving house in the next that kind of well sort of in the next two five two to five years and like whether that's a, a place in this sort of in the city where we are now or moving out more into the countryside in scotland or maybe so not you in may Scot literally you you may be waking up in a place you've literally never been yeah or different or could be it could be a different part of the world entirely so yeah. um yeah so, so what, no, what i would do with you is to try to help you think about some of the changes that might happen between now and then. So for example, as you're trying to picture like yourself waking up 10 years from now, can you imagine one way your body might be physically different? Right. So sort of think about that. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, but so it sort of, it plants a concrete detail of change. Um, can you think about what might be different in terms of who lives with you? You know, pets and kids being older or, you know, yeah, I won't have, I won't have a two year old, sort of jumping on the bed. Right, a 12 year old, right? So maybe you start you start to imagine the 12 year olds, you know, getting her awake instead of the two year old. Um, and we start just to plant these seeds about, uh, you know, what, what you might be doing differently in your day to day life that you're waking up with the first thing in mind. And so, so I create these tools that help people start to really identify concrete ways that their lives might change, the climate might change, society might change, so that instead of that sort of initial blank that you have, that we can fill it in mm. with possibilities. Great, and uh, I guess you, so you talk about these unimaginable and unthinkable, and like you said, those are words which have been had a lot of um, currency in the last 18 months, and obviously with the, with the pandemic and everything, and most people would say maybe that they, they never saw it coming, but not you, right? Because I remember like, because when I, you know, when I was covering, look at sort of interested in your work back in the day, Back in I think it was twenty two thousand eight, or well, and you, you were and and then you did another one another a couple of years later. You ran a couple of you know quite large scale simulations, and the context was around respiratory pan, respiratory pandemics. Who knew, right? And really large scale across the world, of which I was of, I was one of them. As um, and you know what participants were sort of invited to do was to imagine what would they do in such a context and what their life would be like and all the different. Um, me mechanics and mechanisms that might play out and they were set in the future obviously and then the future was you know 20 pretty much now like 2019 2020 I think yeah. it was yeah. so you you actually so you got the ch you actually got the chance to compare what actually happened in real life to what we imagined or the, the that participant group imagined would happen 
So what did you learn from that? How did, like, how did those simulations work? Remind me, it was a long time ago, so you'll, you'll remember a lot better than me. Um, yeah. But uh, and what did you learn, and how, like, how do those two things compare? Yeah. So um, the other kind of simulation that I create are these social simulations, as you said, where we might have five thousand or ten thousand or twenty thousand people immerse themselves in a future scenario, and every day they might sort of, you know, send us some information about what they would be doing or feeling or needing or wanting in the scenario that we've described. So in 2008, we ran this social simulation of a pandemic. Um, it was set in the year 2019. And we asked players, you know, well, if you had to quarantine, what would you need to make it possible, right? What would be hard for you? What, what would you have a hard time not doing, even if you knew that your health was at risk? You know, what, what would you still go out and do? Um, we asked people to get masks and wear them in everyday context and sort of get familiar with that mask wearing and, and you know, what, what was hard about that? And, and you know, it, was it a habit they could adapt? And we collected all of that information, um, you know, just as a way of trying to, it, you know, you can predict what a virus might do based on you know, computer simulations, but people are tricky. One of the most striking things um, that I, I, was, I was so curious about when we originally ran the simulation was what people said they were gonna do no matter what, right? Sure. Weddings, funerals, young people were gonna go to you know dance clubs, they were gonna throw underground night, like, like if there was a chance to go be hot and sweaty with people of the opposite sex, like who care? It's like, I will, I, I'm gonna do it anyway. And so in the start of 2020, when the real pandemic happened, we did a webinar with, well, here's what people said they would do. Let's keep an eye on this. These are likely to be super spreader events. Mm. We talked about how it might be hard to get people to uh, adopt mask wearing, that it was going to take a lot of kind of social wrangling. As you know, the actual pandemic rolled out, it turned out that, yeah, the problems people said they would have, they had. The irrational behaviors they said they would do, they did. The, you know, the things they refused to do in our simulation, many people refused to do in reality. Um, so that was all very interesting, but I will tell you what really has energize me this year about you know, these kind the ability to forecast the future and, and simulate the future wasn't you know being right about what would happen it's all the stories that i've heard from people in the past 18 months about how they felt less anxiety or less overwhelmed than their peers like they felt they had pre-processed what i'm really have discovered through this experience is that helping people simulate these crises and work through the difficult emotions, work through the shock, work through the anxiety and the, the horror and everyone. Do, that, do the feeling part now when it's safe. Um, and then when you have to act or adapt or help others, um, you won't be stuck in those emotions. We've got a little bit of time left, just a little bit, just um, maybe you can tell us, you know, as certainly here in the UK, we're sort of starting to, to come back to a bit of normal, certainly later this year, later this sort of um, fall time, summer fall. and. Um, as that happens, like, so what should I, to, to make me more better prepared for the, the next future, um, um, what should I be looking to sim simulate or imagine in, a, in that sort of a sort of holistic way yeah. to give me the tools to prepare for, what would it be, 2032, yes. I guess. Yes, yes, so 2032, two big things. Um, one is increasing... Uh, brittleness of our infrastructure in terms of things like internet and power, which is a kind of mm. hilarious because right before we recorded this conversation, the extreme heat where I live now is 110 degrees and the power went out and the internet went out five minutes before you're we supposed to have this conversation. And I was like, I am never going to schedule anything <laughs> live on the internet again because um, because extreme weather and climate change is putting such a burden on our mm. our internet and our power and our water resources. So I think so that fragility, that fragility, yeah. That yeah, feels... the fragility and, and starting to really be adaptable and really like in the same way that we've had to over the past 18 months to understand, you know, the air quality may not be good for a month. What is, do I send my kid to school or do I, do I you know, school at home for a month because I don't want them, and, you know, to be, to be really flexible. We're all going to have to be um, flexible. And then the other thing is um, climate, climate related relocation. So international migration or internal displacement, um, up to 2 billion people may have to move because of extreme heat over the next few decades. 
And if you look at how we currently help or don't help people who have to move to new places, um, this is something humanity could really put a little energy into getting better at. Jane, I think that's our time. I'm afraid oh, no. we could chat. We, we could, we've, got a, we've got a lot to catch up on, but, but not for now, I'm afraid. We'll have to do it another time. But um, uh, so thank you again, Jane, so much for your time.